Praise God. Today we're going to look at the parable of the wicked tenants. The parable of the wicked tenants. Spoiler alert. Today's text gives the reason for God's rejection of the nation of Israel. Using the parable of the wicked tenants, Jesus illustrated clearly and vividly the reason for the rejection. The church of Jesus Christ has been around for nearly 2,000 years. It started with a handful of Jewish believers. The fledgling church was predominantly Jewish. Then, as the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire, Gentile, many Gentiles believed in Christ and joined the church. After several decades, there were more Gentile believers than Jewish believers in most churches. And by the end of the first century, there were not many Jewish believers left. The church of Jesus Christ at that time comprised predominantly of Gentile believers. Now this has led many Christians then and now to believe that God is done with Israel, that God has rejected Israel completely. There is no turning back for Israel. Her destiny is sealed. Replacements theology teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. The church has superseded Israel. Its proponents argue that God has set aside Israel and made the church the new Israel. In the aftermath of the Hamas incursion on the 23rd of October into Israel, where as many as 1,200 Israelis were killed and 250 hostages were taken. Quite a number of Christians are pushing the pernicious lie that the Jews in Israel today are not real Jews. They are not biological Jews. There is no genetic connection with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And others have contended that the modern state of Israel has no legitimacy in the eyes of God because it is a creation of secular Zionists. Like the replacement theology, all these attempts are aimed to delegitimize Israel and push the mistaken belief or lie that God's rejection of Israel 2,000 years ago is final and irreversible. Notice the subtitle for today's sermon is Israel is rejected but for how long? Israel is rejected, but for how long? Well, the parable of the wicked tenants explains the reason for God's rejection of Israel. I'm going to end this sermon by using scriptures to argue that God's plan for Israel is not completed as yet. Israel still features in God's plan. Israel still features in God's grand redemptive plan for the world. God will work to restore Israel. And finally, as according to the scriptures, all Israel will be saved at the end of this present age. Now, before we read the text for today, uh, let me give the context, the context of the parable, the context of the text. Jesus told the parable of the wicked uh, tenants on the third day of the Passion Week. That is on the Tuesday of the Passion Week. On the first day of the Passion Week, the Palm Sunday, Jesus rode on the donkey into Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Into Jerusalem. The crowd welcomed him, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a significant moment, which is commonly known as the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Essentially, by that act, Jesus was offering himself to the nation of Israel as her Messiah. We know that the religious leaders and most of the Jews rejected Jesus because barely five days later, they crucified him on the cross. On the same day after the triumphal entry, Jesus went into the temple and disrupted everything inside there. He went into the temple and he began to turn the tables of the money changers and created and drove out all that sold and bought in the temple. Then on the second day, which is a Monday, 
Jesus cursed a fig tree, saying, May no fruit ever come from you again. Jesus was cursing Israel because Israel, because the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. Jesus cursed Israel because she was spiritually barren. On the third day, Tuesday, Jesus went into the temple again. The chief priests and the elders then questioned him uh, about the temple cleansing incident. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And as you read that, as you read that the incident in Matthew chapter twenty-one, you realize that Jesus refused to answer them. Instead, he told them three parables. The first is the parable of the two sons. Second is the parable of the wicked tenants, and then the third is the parable of the wedding feast. In the parable of the two sons, Jesus likened the religious leaders to the second son who promised his father that he would work in the vineyard, but he didn't follow through on the promise. The idea here is that the chief priests and elders of Israel fail in their duties and responsibilities that God has entrusted to them concerning Israel. And so, the outcasts of society, such as the tax collectors and the prostitutes, would enter the kingdom of God ahead of them. In the second parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, Jesus illustrated graphically the religious leader's willful rejection of Christ. Now, let's turn to the text and read Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 all the way to 46. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to him. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowd because they held him to be a prophet. Now let us first take a look at the parable which we read in verses 33 to 41. Just like many of Jesus' parables, uh, this is a simple story that the first century Christians can relate to, but it contains a twist. The parable starts with a landowner who planted a vineyard. Vineyards were a common sight in ancient Israel. Uh, as wine production was one of the mainstays of the economy. So you, you see vineyards littered all over the hillsides of ancient Israel. It was quite normal for a rich person to buy a piece of land, develop the land into a vineyard. He would build a wall around the vineyard to protect it from wild animals and thieves. Next, he would make a wine press. Usually it was hewn out of a solid bedrock uh, and it would have at least 
two vats or two basins. The upper large but shallow basin was used for crushing grapes. You know, men will get into men will get into that basin and they will be treading on the grapes with their feet. That's how wine will make uh, back in the ancient days, uh, unlike unlike uh, today. And then the grape juice will flow down through a trough into a lower basin. From there, it will be collected and stored in wine skins or in clay jars for fermentation. Usually, a tower will be built. It was used as a lookout uh, for, the, for the guards. At the same time, it can be used as a resting place for the laborers in the vineyard and also as a storage area. Now, Jesus gave the details of the vineyard. I believe that it shows that the vineyard was meticulously planned and properly constructed. When everything was in place, the vineyard owner then leased out the vineyard to tenants. These are vine growers. He would negotiate the rental amount. Usually the payment was a percentage of the harvest. Okay, the payment was a percentage of the fruit produced. The tenants would pay the owner with part of the, of the produce of the harvest and keep the rest for themselves. Now, this actually is a fair deal. If the harvest was bad due to bad weather or due to pests, the tenants would pay less renter. However, if there was a bountiful harvest, the owner would get his share of the abundance. Everything went on well and har- until the harvest time. This is where the twist in the story occurs. The owner sent his servants to collect his share of the fruit. But the tenants reneged on the rental agreement and refused to pay up. Instead of paying, they brutally mistreated the owner's servants. We read in verse 35 of Matthew 21, And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Now that is terrible. But the owner was undeterred. He he sent more servants second time around to chase the debt owing to him. But the wicked and unreasonable tenants did exactly the same thing as to the first group of servants. Now, I cannot understand why they did what they did. They were operating in a good vineyard and it had produced a decent harvest. Just pay what was due to the owner as per their agreement, fair and square. They didn't need to do what they were doing. But greed got the better of the tenants. After that, the owner decided to send his son, thinking that they would respect his son. After all, he is the son. Surely they won't lay a finger on him. But the tenants had other ideas. Probably, they thought that the owner had died and the son has come to, to, to claim his inheritance. They saw this as an opportunity to seize the entire property for themselves. We read in verse 39, And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. This is daylight robbery and cold-blooded murder. There is no doubt that the tenant's action was premeditated. They knew exactly what they were doing. Well, they didn't plan that. All right? they, didn't, they didn't start with that idea uh, at the beginning. Initially, they only wanted to have all of the produce, all of the grapes and profits for themselves. They become greedier when the opportunity presents itself. Now, you know, some people, when they read this parable, they say that, look, this is ridiculous. The entire story is ridiculous. They find the story unrealistic. They say that things like that don't happen. If it does happen, it is rare. Uh, not just one tenant. All the tenants would have to be psychopathic uh, for, for this kind of scenario to take place. But this is the nature of parables. Quite often, parables are exaggerated. Jesus intentionally introduced this twist into the story and exaggerated the tenants' behavior to make it look ridiculously 
bizarre. Jesus did all this to highlight the extraordinary patience of God as represented by the vineyard owner and the brutality of the religious leaders as represented by the tenants. Through the parable, Jesus also hinted of his death in the hands of the religious leaders who wanted to protect their own prestige and their self-interest. The tenants, as I think it is very obvious, the tenants represent the religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders of the temple, while the son of the vineyard owner represents the son of God. I think this parable is quite simple to understand. You don't really need to dig, <clears throat> dig and dig and dig in order to decipher the meaning. The chief priests and the elders and the other people listening to Jesus were drawn into the story. They deeply sympathize with the plight of the vineyard owner and rage at the savagery and the brutality of the tenants. In typical rabbinic style, Jesus posed a question to let his listeners conclude the story. Jesus, if you read, you realize that Jesus didn't conclude the story himself. He let them conclude the story by posing a question. Okay, so we read in verse 40 of Matthew 21. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? Now, first of all, let me pause here for a moment to ask you a question. Who were Jesus' listeners? Who were the listeners? Okay, primarily they were the, they were the chief priests okay, and the religious leaders, the elders of the temple and a lot of Pharisees and other religious leaders. There were, of course, other people in the crowd. As you read the parable, you understand that it was a large crowd. Okay, but... I believe that these, those religious leaders were standing right in front of Jesus, listening to the parable. So, how did they respond to Jesus' question? We look at verse 41. They say to Jesus, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Now, that is the right answer. And that is a fitting conclusion to the parable. Jesus himself would have concluded the parable in that way. Imagine that coming from the mouths of the religious leaders. Okay, you, you read, you may not catch it, but I want you to imagine that coming out from the mouth of the religious leaders. They didn't realize that they had taken Jesus' bait and fallen into his trap. They were just too eager to parade their self-righteousness and in doing so, incriminate themselves. Next, Jesus went on to explain what he was trying to convey through the parable. Given that the chief priests and the elders of the temple didn't quite catch its meaning, I find that rather strange because the parable is rather easy to understand. A parable is rather, the uh, uh, meaning of the parable is rather obvious, especially coming at the back of the question they asked Jesus about who gave him the authority to cleanse the temple. And after Jesus had told them the parable of the two sons, how come they still don't catch it? I don't understand. These are smart people, yet they didn't catch it. Very clearly, the owner of the vineyard is God, the heavenly father, and the son is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the tenants are the chief priests and elders and all the other religious leaders. Anyway, Jesus went on to reinforce what he was trying to convey through the parable with a quote from the Old Testament scripture. And this quote is taken from Psalms 118 verses 22 to 23. But we will not read from Psalms 118, we will read from today's passage. Let's look at verse 42 again. Jesus said to them, okay, if you catch the drift, you realize that Jesus was talking to them in a rather sarcastic manner. You guys are experts in the Holy Scripture. But have you read? Have you, have you, have you never read in the Scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
This is the exact same quote taken from Psalms 118 verses 22 to 23. Now, Psalms 118 is a messianic psalm, meaning to say that it speaks prophetically about the person of the Messiah, the person of Christ, which we know is Jesus Christ. This is also the psalm where the crowd quoted when welcoming Jesus during the triumphal entry, two days before Jesus told the parable of the wicked tenants. Okay, if we read Psalms 118, verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, remember during the tri triumphal entry, or they were singing, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's taken also from that messianic psalm in Psalms 118. So if you go back to verse 42, you realize the mention of the word cornerstone. The stone that they rejected is the cornerstone. Question, what is a cornerstone? What is a cornerstone? Now in ancient times, when buildings were put up, the alignment and proper placement of every part of the building follow the cornerstone. So the cornerstone is essentially a reference, a reference point. Okay? So it is an important point. It is a reference point. If the cornerstone were not cut or placed properly, the layout, the stability and the integrity of the building would be adversely affected. It would be compromised. Only good only the good and right cornerstone would be selected. Now, in quoting, uh, sometimes certain cornerstones would be rejected because they were defective, either uh, during the manufacture or, or defective because of quality. Only good and, 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 and the right one would be selected. In quoting Psalms 118 verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus was applying this prophecy to himself. Jesus was applying the prophecy to himself. He was the stone that the builders rejected and he would be the cornerstone. He was the stone that the religious leaders of Israel rejected, but he would be the cornerstone of God's new temple. He will be the cornerstone of God's new temple. Now, this new temple, as we know, the new covenant temple, uh, was not is not built with hands. Was not is not built with human hands. Rather, they comprise the church, which which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Not Gentiles only, but both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus was the son in the parable, whom the tenants kill. Jesus was the Son of God whom the religious leaders rejected and would kill barely a few days later. Three days to be precise on Good Friday. Sometime later, Peter testified before the chief priests, the elders, uh, the scribes and the rulers of Israel. Acts, look at, let's look at Acts chapter 4 verses 10 to 12. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucify, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by him, the man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be safe. And later, Jesus, later Peter would write in his first epistles. We look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. For it stands in Scripture Behold, I, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders had rejected, uh, rejected has become the cornerstone. So let me say this again. Okay, this is an important quotation from Psalms 118. When Jesus was quoting from Psalms 118 verses 22 to 23, Jesus was essentially reinforcing, uh, saying that immediately after 
telling the parable to be kids. Jesus was reinforcing the point that he was the son that the tenants had killed, that he was a son of God whom the religious leaders had rejected and would later kill. He was reinforcing the fact that he was the prophesied cornerstone for God's new temple that the religious leaders had rejected. The religious, the religious leaders and the nation of Israel would have to face serious consequences for their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. And as, as you will realize as we move along, that this is one of the biggest consequences that had ramification throughout the last 2,000 years. Okay, let's read Matthew chapter 21, verses 43 to 44 again. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now, I can imagine that Jesus was looking straight into the eyes of these religious leaders as he was pronouncing this curse or rather uh, these judgments upon, uh, on, the, on the religious leaders and on the nation of Israel. What are the consequences? What are the consequences for the rejection of Jesus by the religious leaders? First, the kingdom of God will be taken away from them and from the nation of Israel. That's the influence and power of leadership. The religious leaders had a tremendous influence over the ordinary, uh, over the ordinary people, uh, over their religious belief and practices. Their vocal and open rejection of Jesus influenced the people's opinion concerning Jesus. And many also ended up rejecting Jesus. Also, the leader's decision to reject Jesus had a bearing on the entire nation. That's because their decision represented the collective will of the nation. Therefore, the leader's decision to reject Jesus means that the entire nation of Israel also rejected Christ. For their rejection, God would take the kingdom of God away from them. Second, the kingdom of God will be given to a people producing its fruit. Who are these people that is producing the fruit? This is the church. We comprise both Jews and Gentiles. The kingdom of God will be taken from Israel and given over to the church. Israel will no longer be God's vineyard. The religious leaders and the Jewish people will no longer be the tenants taking care of God's vineyard. The church will take over the baton to be God's witness in the world. Now let us look at verses 45 and 46 of Matthew chapter 21 again. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Now by this time, the religious leaders suddenly realized that Jesus was talking about them. You know, all this while, they were mesmerized by the story. They didn't even know that Jesus was talking about them. But here, it suddenly occurred to them, dude, they are talking, he is talking about us. You know, so they awakened, they were awakened to the fact. It was somewhat a little bit too slow for smart Alex like them. Okay, too slow, too slow. Usually their minds work very fast when they are facing Christ. So they were the second son in the parable of the two sons who say yes to, to, to the father to work in the vineyard but later refused to follow up with what they have promised. They were the wicked tenants in the parable of the wicked tenants who killed the servants and then the son of the vineyard. They were the builders who rejected the stone that would later become the cornerstone. They were guilty of resisting and rejecting Jesus, the Son of God and the Messiah. Could you imagine that for a thousand over years, 
they were waiting for this Messiah to come. And then when the Messiah appeared right before them in flesh, they couldn't recognize him at all. And I'm just thinking that when Jesus returned again, will the church recognize him? You know, that's just a side thought. So consequently, they will be rejected by God and forbidden to enter the kingdom of God because of their rejection of Jesus. They heard what Jesus said to them, but they refused to heed his warning. They will not be persuaded to consider that what Jesus said about them might just be true. They understood what Jesus said, but they will not repent because they were too proud and they had a self-interest to protect. They refused to be convinced and therefore they, will be, they could not be convicted of their sins. They would not repent and therefore they could not be forgiven. Tragedy. It is a tragedy. These were the religious leaders of Israel. These were the elders of Israel. These were the chief priests of Israel. They know the scripture. They could memorize the Torah you know, by swimming backstroke. They could just do all that. Yet, they miss the Messiah altogether. Instead of responding positively to Jesus, their minds were only preoccupied with thoughts of self-justification as to how they can rebut Jesus and their minds were also preoccupied with revenge. Their, instructive, their instinctive response was to lay hold of Jesus, arrest him and then kill him. But they did not do it because they feared the crowds who believed that Jesus was a prophet sent by God. What an irony. These people were the religious leaders of Israel. Yet, they fear, they, they fear the people and they, do not, and they did not fear God. So, they will have to wait for another an opportune time when the opinion of the people changed and turned against Jesus. Well, they didn't have to wait for too long. Barely a few days later, the people became disillusioned with Jesus because they finally realized that Jesus was not the political Messiah that they had been waiting for to liberate them from Rome. Instead, Jesus was the suffering Messiah who would die for their sins. And that wasn't the kind of Messiah that they wanted. And so they rejected Jesus. Even the disciple Judas was so disappointed that he betrayed. Why? Because Jesus was not coming as a political liberator. When the Roman governor Pontius Pilate gave the crowd the choice to release either Jesus or the ins insurrectionists, and murderer Barabbas. They chose Barabbas. When Pontius Pilate asked, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And the people shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And so my dear brothers and sisters, Israel rejected Jesus and consequently, God rejected Israel. Israel is rejected, but for how long? And as I said earlier in the sermon, this is the subtitle of the sermon. And in the final segment of today's sermon, I'm going to address this question directly, briefly. This is an important question, okay? A very important question. And so we need to understand what the Bible says about it. Is God's rejection of Israel cast in concrete and therefore irreversible? Can Israel be restored if she repents? What does the Bible say about all this? For the last 2,000 years, Christians have wrestled with this question. Why? Because when they look at the church of Jesus Christ, it comprises mostly of Gentile believers. Few Jews believe in Jesus. And this has been the case since a century after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Also, Israel was pushed out of a historical homeland by the Romans in AD 135, and it was scattered among many nations. That's why many Christians believe that God is done with Israel, and Israel doesn't feature in God's plan anymore. 
But the return of the Jews into the, back to the promised land in the early part of the 20th century and the reconstitution of the nation of Israel or the rebirth of Israel in, on May 14, 1948 should make these Christians rethink and re-examine their positions in the light of the Scriptures. Well, I address this matter fairly comprehensively in my latest pastoral reflection titled, Does, God still matter, Does Israel Still Matter to God? Go and read it. For the remaining part of this sermon, I'm just going to briefly talk about this, you know, talk about, uh, talk about it. What do I believe about the destiny of Israel? Has God abandoned Israel or will God restore His chosen nation? Now, as far as I'm concerned, the Bible, our Bible is very, very clear. It provides very clear answers as to the destiny of of Israel. God is not done with Israel yet. Israel still features in God's plan. Israel still features in God's redemptive plan and is a grand, grand plan to save the entire world, as many as would receive Him as Christ. So despite God's rejection 2,000 years ago, God will restore her someday in the future. I believe it is going to be in the near future. In fact, the restoration has already begun. It began in the early part of the 20th century, like what I said earlier, when the Jews began to regather, began to come back to the promised land, to their historical homeland from all over the world and with the rebirth of Israel in 1948. But this is only the physical restoration. The spiritual restoration will come later during the tribulation, which is the last seven years at the end of this present age. Now, most of you are aware of the present Israeli-Iranian conflict in the Middle East. Now, recently, Iran fired 180 ballistic missiles at Israel. You know how fast a ballistic missile travel? 12 minutes is all it requires to go from Iran to Israel. Why? Because it goes into space, out of the space, back into the earth atmosphere, and then, all right, to hit Israel. But fascinatingly, the damage is minimal. 180 ballistic missiles. That is the largest number ever fired in the history of mankind. Yet, the damages were minimal. Many secular Jews are beginning to be persuaded that God just might be real, that this Jesus Christ whom they call Yeshua just might be real and is watching over Israel and protecting her. Is this the first spark of a great awakening that will be coming upon the Jews? It is possible. If you read the book of Zechariah, you will realize that it is through wars and destruction that all Israel would finally be saved. So let us watch and see. Now let's look at the, what the Bible says about God's restoration of Israel. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul asked a question. And then after that, he answered his own question. Okay, we look at Romans chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. So this is Paul speaking. Paul said, I ask, then has God rejected his people? By no means exclamation mark, by no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. This is as straight an answer, as clear an answer that you can get from the Holy Scripture concerning the destiny of the Jews. Paul was clear and emphatic in his assertion that God has not rejected His chosen people, that God has not abandoned His chosen people, that, that, that God's plan for Israel is not completed as yet. After that, Paul went on to say that God has always kept a random remnant for Himself when the majority of Israel fell into apostasy. That is the, the way God works. 
every time Israel fall, whether it's during the book of Judges, during the book, uh, during the time of Judges, or during the time of the kings, God always preserved for Himself a remnant. Paul gave a historical example. Elijah thought that he was the only faithful person left in the entire Israel. But then God said to him, we read this in Romans chapter 11, verses 4 to 5. I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. We've got to understand that God always keeps a remnant for Himself, whether it's Israel or the church in the last days. God will always keep a faithful remnant for Himself. Then Paul went on to argue that while the Jews might have fallen off or fallen away, God has the power to restore them again. Using the analogy of the grafting of olive branches. Look a few verses down in Romans chapter 11, verses 23 to 24. And even they, referring to the Jews, referring to Israel, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you, and this is referring to Gentile believers, for if you were cut off, you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? And Paul didn't stop there. He went on to review exactly when God would restore the Jewish people. He didn't give a date. I know that Christians love dates, all right? He didn't give a date, but he gave a very specific marker. Verses 25 and 27 of Romans, the whole, I mean, the whole argument continues. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Uh, why, do we know why Paul said that? Because during, at, at that time, in the church in Rome, they were arguing the fact that God is done with Israel already. You see, in our church, there are not many Jews. God is done with Israel. So Paul is saying this here. Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Like the rapture, this is a mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Let me unpack this briefly, okay? I want you to take note of two things that Paul said here. First, Paul revealed a mystery. The mystery of the timing of the restoration of the nation of Israel. When will this momentous event take place? It will take place, it will take place after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Essentially, this refers to the end of the church age. The church age will come to an end. The church age began when the church was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost in the aftermath of Jesus' death, resurrection. And ascension. The church is started after God rejected Israel. That is the teaching of the parable of the wicked tenant. Okay, so the church began after the rejection of Israel, but, uh, rejection uh, of, of Christ by Israel. There is a beginning and there will be an end to the church age. It will end when the full number of Gentile believers have been gathered into the church. Only God knows the number and only God knows when it will happen. When the church age draws to a close, God will remove the church from the earth. This is the rapture. You know, just as 2,000 years ago, when Israel rejected Christ, God removed Israel from the sin and God puts the church into the prophetic sin. But at the end of the church age, the church will be taken off. And we call this the rapture. The seven-year tribulation 
will begin after that. And God will make use of these seven years not only to judge the world, but also to deal with the nation of Israel. Israel will go through the worst time of her entire existence. The Antichrist will wreak havoc in Israel and many nations will fight against her. Through a series of unprecedented troubles, wars and destruction, the Jews will be saved. They will acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah. The prophet Zechariah prophesied that two-thirds of Israel will be decimated. That means completely killed. Two-thirds of all the Jews in Israel will be completely decimated and one-third will survive. And this one-third, all of this one-third, the remnants will be saved. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 to 9. In the whole land declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this one-third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is my God. And in this way, all Israel will be saved just as what Paul argued in Romans chapter 11. Second, this is God's covenant with Israel and you and I know that God will never break covenant. God will keep His promises and when God finds it fit to cut a covenant with, His, with Israel, God will not break it. And God's covenant to restore Israel will never be broken, will not be broken. You can be sure of that. Paul reinforced the certainty of God's covenant to restore Israel when he said two verses later, verse 29 of Romans 11, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Therefore, Israel will be restored. Israel will be restored and then the end of this present age will come with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, is God's rejection of Israel cast in concrete and irreversible? No. An absolute no. Will God restore Israel? Yes. When will God restore Israel? After the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and during the tribulation, which is the last seven years of this present age. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, pray for Israel. Pray for the salvation of the Jews. Pray for God's will to be done for Israel and for the Jews. It is our responsibility to pray according to the will of God. Not because we love Israel and some people didn't like Israel. A lot of Christians don't like Israel and they say, I'm not going to pray for Israel. But what I'm calling here is that let's pray for Israel because it is the will of God. It is part of His grand scheme of things. It begins, His redemptive plan began with Israel and it will end with Israel. And in eternity, you know in eternity, the place that you and I are going to live in is not in heaven, not in a new heaven, but on the new earth. Where on the new earth? In New Jerusalem. In a city called New Jerusalem where the streets will be paved with gold. And then, you know, the, the 12 gates, they'll be named after the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel will feature in God's plan forever and ever and ever. Amen? Shall we all stand? Let's worship the Lord.